life can't be reduced to his biology. What about the things that will happen to him, especially in early childhood? And it was this question that inspired the most famous psychologist of all, Sigmund Freud. The psychodynamic approach is a broad area which suggests that you should be able to explain behaviour in terms of what drives it, what motivates it, that's why it's called dynamic. The psychodynamic approach in psychology is generally defined as an approach which, which discusses the unconscious motivations of individuals. The psychodynamic approach evolved at the beginning of the century as a result of the work of Sigmund Freud. Freud thought that the most important thing that happened to someone in their life was their childhood. Everything in their later life stemmed from those childhood experiences. Yeah, I can think of instances in my childhood that have influenced me now and got me where I am today. My threat was, you know, if you, if you turn out like your brother, you're out of the house. I don't care how old you are, you're out of the house. And so that was always a threat to me and I always tried not to be like my brother. Freud didn't just say that childhood experiences influence the adult personality. His unique contribution was to suggest that this happened through the operation of an unconscious mind. The unconscious is that part of your mind which is not immediately accessible to you. But it was a fundamental part of Freud's theory because he felt that it was your unconscious that more than anything drives your behaviour. He thought there was only a small fraction of our personality that was actually available to us, that was, that was conscious, that we knew about. He saw the adult personality as being like an iceberg and it was only the tip that we had access to. There were these unresolved conflicts from our childhood still going on beneath the surface. Well, we can't understand many of the things that happened to us as children, we still experience them emotionally. Psychoanalytic theory argues that these experiences become buried in our unconscious and influence us in later life. But how does this process happen? Freud thought that personalities had three main aspects to them the id, the ego and the superego. The id is the first bit of the personality to develop, it's the bit that the child's born with, it's the instinctive part, it's the, if you like, I always think of it as the feed me, feed me now bit. It's, it needs instant gratification. At four months, Oliver's still in the id stage of development, with his parents attending to his needs. But few stay at the id stage for long, though there are exceptions. As the child develops, he has to learn in society to control this id, sexuality and aggression. And as he grows in the first five years, he develops first of all an ego, which is equivalent to the rational side. So he knows when, the child knows when he or she can do things and can't do things, simple rules and regulations. And after a bit, by the age of about four or five, the the, these rules become internalised and that's called the superego or conscience. That's the morality aspect, the right and wrong. It's the little Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder that says that's not very nice, that's not being a good girl, you don't want to do that. When I'm arguing with my mum or something, I sort of, I really want something and I'm arguing for it but then I feel really guilty because I know I'm making my mum really miserable so, you know, I shouldn't argue, so that's what usually makes me stop my guilty conscience. <laughs> the job of the ego then in the personality is to balance the id and the superego. Obviously if you've got too much of the id, you're not going to be a very nice person. But if you've got too much of the superego, it's sort of the Mary Poppins syndrome, isn't it? It's the guilt about everything. So the, the ego's role is to balance those two instincts. In psychoanalytic theory, unresolved conflicts in childhood can cause problems in later life. Irrational behaviour, behaviour we can't even understand ourselves, may be the result of unconscious motivations bubbling to the surface. Right then. Well, I think our previous discussion was... The role of therapy here is to explore these unconscious motivations. When I was nine... The influence of Freudian theory goes well beyond psychology. It's had a massive influence on modern culture, and the way we now think about ourselves and the world. 
Freudian terminology is now very much part of everyday language. People use it often without even realising it's Freudian. We talk about to be in denial, we talk about repression, things like we talk about someone being orally fixated, we say that certain people are very anal. All these things are Freudian terms, but we now use them in everyday language, everyday conversation. And they're also widely used by literate, educated, Hampstead style individuals who think they've found the key to human behaviour. But within psychology, Freudian theory and its case study method is heavily criticised. The biggest criticism really is that it's untestable. Because you haven't got direct access to the unconscious, it's difficult to prove. Freudian theory cannot be stated in a testable way. And even where it is testable, if it is at all, it, it isn't quantifiable. And quantification has been the mainstay of all the natural sciences. The theory was evolved generalising from a very few number of clients to the whole of society. So is it still relevant today? Psychodynamic approach to psychology is still very relevant today. It's got very many therapeutic applications. The idea of an unconscious is still relevant. There are huge things that we don't know about ourselves. We find this in our everyday life. We know it intuitively. We find things out about ourselves that surprise us. I talk to people. I don't know why I talk to them, but it's just say stuff to people that you really shouldn't say to people. When we have dreams, we're often surprised about what we dream about. I used to have a dream had it quite a few times about a bridge and there was just mist around the bridge and it was quite gothic on the other side of the bridge but on my side of the bridge it was all sunny and rainbows and sheep and stuff and it was just ridiculous but then on the other side it was quite dark and dingy and I could only get halfway across the bridge and then once I was halfway across the bridge I couldn't get back. Recent research in America has tended to confirm Freud's view that dreaming does indeed provide access to unconscious thought processes. Although many of Freud's ideas now seem very dated, even to psychoanalytic psychologists, his key idea of the mind being in a state of permanent conflict between conscious and unconscious desires is generally accepted and widely applied to a range of behaviours. While the biological perspective holds that many behavioural problems may have physical causes, the psychoanalytic perspective, in contrast, argues that many mental and physical conditions may be psychosomatic, that is, have psychological and emotional causes. The interaction processes between the parent and the child would be dysfunctional in some way. For example, the parent may not, um, may be a very controlling uh, or, and rejecting parent, and this will affect the way in which the child relates to the world and will determine how they relate to the world as an adult. Does this theory suggest then that if you have bad experiences in childhood, you're doomed to a troubled and unhappy life? Many people do view Freudian theories as deterministic, but it's not necessarily so. Yes, if you've had problems in your childhood, they are going to affect you in adult life, but that doesn't mean that you can't do something about it. Simply by going to therapy, someone is taking that first step. They're trying to resolve those childhood conflicts. Biology and unconscious motivation may be important, but some psychologists are less interested in what goes on in here and more interested in what's going on out there. The question of how...